Hi folks, uh, this is Richard Hall, well actually what you can see is not Richard Hall, it was Keith actually, pretending to be me, yeah. Hello, <laughs> how are you doing? Right, and uh, welcome along to the night sky, we we don't have Kay with us because she's ho holding the fort out at Stonehenge and so on, in fact, as talking, of, talking about that, first of all I should point out a few things we've got happening at Stonehenge at the moment, and yes, Right there. Okay, just to, just to mention first of all that we're open at the moment from every day, seven days a week, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Right in January, and then after that uh, in February we'll be going back to Wednesday through to Sunday. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, we're also doing night sky tours and things like that. And was at long last we got some absolutely fabulous weather, haven't we? And mm. that young guy Keith over there has been hel helping out on that as well. Yeah. Yes, uh, taking visitors around the um, around the hinge and showing them the wonders of the night sky, <laughs> and we've had some very clear nights over the last few days, yeah. last few nights, I should say. Yes. Yeah, and just also to mention that we have c coming up in uh, March, a uh, Thursday, March the fourteenth. Actually, we've got Dave Flynn coming out and doing a special. Uh, musical evening there on Celtic Guitar Journey. All right. Now, if you'd like to learn more about this, you can go onto a web page. If you you can't just turn up, you'll need to get tickets for this. Okay. So, but you can do all of that uh, on our web page and so on. Okay. So that's Dave Finn Celtic Guitar Journey coming up. <laughs> okay. So, well, we're starting off uh, looking at the northern sky at the moment. Of course, we still get that big bright star in the sky, which is, of course, the, the planet Jupiter at the moment. Uh, always stands out. Uh, planet means wandering star, and that's what our ancestors saw the most wandering stars. Jupiter, of course, is the brightest, but it's also the biggest planet in the solar system, an absolutely fabulous object to look at in the night sky. Oh, sorry, for a telescope and so on. Now, but of course, the most the most prominent uh, group of stars in our sky at the moment is Orion. And I guess just about anyone can notice it. For us here in New Zealand, it is a sign of summer, right? While Orion is in the sky, we're going to have the lazy, hazy days of summer. Absolutely opposite in the uh, northern hemisphere, it's actually the sign of winter. Because right, I can always remember Ryan coming at all. Mm -hmm. oh, it's going to be cold, okay? Um, but and we did, I think, at the last last program, we went through and looked at the some of the stars that we've got there in Orion, and indeed it was a, I called it the uh, realm of the giants because indeed those big bright stars in Orion. The giant, they're all giants, all giant or super giant Super stars. giants, yes. yes. And this is something we have to bear in mind. The majority of stars that we see in our night sky are not the common or garden variety of star. They're giants mm. and they dominate our sky simply because they are so bright. You know, sometimes we're talking about tens, hundreds of thousands of times brighter than our sun. So now, there's, there's, there's lots and lots of stars out there, mm. many more stars that we can't see with the naked eye because they're not bright enough. They're yeah, we're the most common yes. star in the galaxy. 70% of the stars are what we call red dwarfs. Yes. You can't see one without a telescope. Right? Yes. And our sun is by no means a, 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 a feeble star. It's actually one of the brightest stars. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but anyway, just to bear that in mind when we're talking about, but I thought what we would do to, today is actually use Orion as a great big signpost in the sky. Simply because everyone can find Orion, then use that signpost to find our way uh, to other bright stars and identify the other bright stars in the sky. So that's what our, pl our plan is. Okay, right. We start off, if we go along the three stars in a line, the belt of Orion, but we go upwards and to the right, we come to the brightest star in the sky. That's the sp star Sirius. Now, any star-like object you can see in the sky that's brighter than Sirius is not a star. And of course, we do have Jupiter there at the yes, moment. It's a on occasion, yes. me, M Mars, Venus, and so on will all sh outshine all of the stars. Yes. Some sometimes people do confuse Venus <coughs> as a particularly bright star because it does have have a starlight, a star-like quality to it. <coughs> but you can always tell Venus because it's close to the 
rising sun or the setting sun. Mm. Yes, you can't see Venus at the moment, but yeah. as Richard said, you can see Jupiter mm. right now. Now, Sirius, well, uh, each of these stars I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, Sirius is the brightest star, so let's have a look at what Sirius was actually like. I'll bring up some pictures. Don't for a moment, folks, think these are photographs. They're not. What they are are artist impressions, often my, me as artist impressions, based upon all the information we have about that star. Now, Sirius... Uh, is a distance of 8.6 light years. That means it's actually one of the sun's neighbours. Right? It's relatively close to us, all right? and it's 25 times brighter than the sun. And the reason for that is uh, uh, it's uh, a little bit more massive, but also a lot hotter. All right? And you can you can tell that even a pair of binoculars. It's got this sort of bluey white colour to it. Yes. The colour of a star, you know, stars are not all white. They have subtle shades of colour even to the naked eye and that tells you the temperature that the star is burning at or at least that the surface of the star is is burning at mm. and some stars are um, sort of an orange red and some stars are yellowish and some are blue white uh, but Sirius is definitely one of the blue white stars mm. and yeah. but anyway the other thing that was discovered actually not a great time, apparently, was that, in fact, Sirius is not a single star, it's a binary star. Now, the reason why it took mm. a bit of a time to discover this, this other star that's orbiting around it is very, very faint, all right? And now, for those of you watching this on TV, I've brought it up, they call it the Pup. And the reason why it's called the Pup is that um, Sirius is the brightest star in Canis Major, the great dog, and therefore is known as the Dog Star. And this one is the pup, okay? <laughs> uh, but as you can see there, it's, it's a faint star. It's 387 times fainter than Sirius, okay? Yes. Uh, sorry, fainter than, fainter than our sun, all right? Yes. Uh, but it, it, the thing is, it's white hot, all right? and it's actually very, very curious. So if you've got something that's very white hot like Sirius, yes. it's emitting a lot of energy from its surface. If it's very faint, it must mean that object is actually very small. And it is, I've just pulled up some diagrams showing you the sun, Sirius, and the pup to scale mm. as far mm. as physical size is concerned, all right? And so we have this little, tiny little dwarf star called the pup orbiting the dog star Sirius. <clears throat> and the pup is how big? About the size of... About the, about, size the size of of the earth, okay? about the size of the earth, okay? It's about the size of the earth. earth. Yes. But yes. don't forget, don't for a moment just think it's on the sort of thing. Sirius and the sun vary in brightness and in colour because of their mass. Here we've got a different situation. The pup itself, right, has right, got the entire mass of the solar system squeezed into an area the size of the earth. Yeah. So consequently, a teaspoonful of its matter, right, would weigh over a thousand tons, all right? Yes. And this object is what we call a white dwarf. It is, in fact, the corpse of a star that existed in the past. So mm -hmm. once upon a time, the Sirius system had a much brighter star than Sirius itself. And because it was bigger and brighter, it went through its life earlier, shed its matter, and all that's left is this pup, which is slowly cooling down. Right. But I'll tell you what, some folks, there's something fascinating about the pup, is you see that it's mostly made up of carbon. That's mm. all that's left. And as it's cooling, it's crystallising right now, turning into a, a solid object. And of course, you realise what it's turning into? It's turning into a diamond. Yes. But a diamond the size of the earth. However, don't think for a moment you can go and sneak off and pinch this diamond because if you stood on the surface of it once it's cooled, you'd have the uncomfortable feeling of weighing something like 10,000 tonnes. And you that would... would squash you flat. Oh, the yeah, you would yes. d vanish so quickly <laughs> that your body would be spread over an area the size yeah. of a football field. Okay. So, so a diamond size of the earth and you can't <laughs> even get it. That's right, yeah. Yes. I know. So there you are. So that's the pup in the sky at the moment. Yeah. Next star we I would to have a take a look. If you come across from the uh, bright belt stars of Orion, we come to another bright star, and that's uh, Procyon, okay? And it's also a, a nearby star, just 11.4 light years away, and it's just under eight times brighter than the sun, okay? So here we've got another one. But the interesting thing about Procyon 
It exactly the, it, it too is a binary star system. It's got a companion, and that companion is also a white dwarf. Yes. Okay. So we have two dog stars. Yeah. And two pups. Yeah, and that's right. As as, as uh, Keith just mentioned, Poseidon is the other dog star. Right. So mm. Orion and his two dogs. So the the arrow is just pointing out to the where it is at the moment. Okay. So we've got this other little tiny star there as well. These are stellar corpses, right? Yeah. <coughs> okay, so if we take the bright star Betelgeuse and Orion, Sirius, the greater dog star, and Poseidon, the lesser dog, they'd form the summer triangle. And folks, it's, they're dead easy to pick out in the night sky at the moment. Absolutely easy, right? So that's, that's the... Um, the Orion now, signpost. In England, where you come from, Richard, would that be the winter triangle? Uh, yes, it would be, yes. yes. But yes. Yeah, God, even where I was, you see, Sirius didn't come very far above the horizon, you know? Yes. Yeah. So, so I've, I've always remembered the summer triangle literally as being um, high in the sky uh, during the, um, you know, the hot, hazy holidays here, here in New Zealand. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so there's some bright stars. So let's have a next look at the next one. Right. If we go straight up from the belt of Orion, we come to the second brightest star in the sky, which is Canopus. Now, <coughs> on this diagram we've got of the star, so you can't see it, because Canopus is the southern star. So we'll go over. There it is there. Doom. Okay. Canopus, the second brightest star in the sky. And we've lost our thing. Look at that. We'll come back. Thank you, for Keith, for watching that. And there, there is, and of course, Canopus is a star when I lived in back in England, what you were talking about, I never saw because it's so far to the south, it never rises in the northern hemisphere. So yes. it is a southern star. Uh, but Canopus, unlike Sirius, and that is, is actually a true giant star, okay? Yeah. Have a, qu a quick look at it. Its distance, of course, is 310 light years, all right? So that means we're seeing it as it was 310 years ago yes. when we look at it. Its diameter is 65 times that of the sun. Its surface temperature is only slightly hotter than the sun, but however, because of its huge size, it's 13,600 times brighter than our sun, all right? Yes. So there's Canopus in the sky. It should be dead easy to pick out, folks. Yeah. Now, you said uh, it's 310 light years away. Uh, how many kilometres in a light year? About 300,000. Yeah. <laughs> no, 300,000 per second, all right? Yeah. So you, you multiply that out by the number of seconds in a year, yes. and so you, you end up with kilometres, yeah. Over, I think it's a hundred trillion yeah. kilometres yeah. in one light year. Light year yeah. is a measure of distance. And this is, and it's, yeah. This is the thing: is because the universe is so large, where everything we see is some great distance away. Mm. Uh, we're seeing it in the past, and the further we look into space, the further but we look back in time. So we never see the universe as it is; we see it as it was. Yes. Right? And likewise, uh, any alien beings on um, a planet orbiting. Um, orbiting those stars, they wouldn't be seeing us as we are. They would be seeing us as we were 300 years ago. Well, that's right, yeah. Yes. If there was someone that there exactly. wouldn't be any around Canopus because yes. it's a giant yes. star. But yeah. no, this is a, a special point. You know, as, as Keith's just saying, is imagine someone a thousand light years away and uh, they were, if they could see, had telescopes big enough to see the Earth, they would be seeing the Earth <laughs> as it was a thousand years ago. They would be see, watch, watching uh, all the activities in medieval Europe. Yeah, well, that's yeah. right, watching yeah. the, the Norman conquests and things yes. like that. Yeah. The, so. the, the, the vastness of space measured in light years, it's like a time machine, mm. and this fascinates me. Yes, yes. yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it's something that we have to bear in mind, particularly when we're talking about alien civilization. And mm. certainly, it, the whole concept of having an empire in space yes. is nonsense, you know. So yeah. because, for example, <laughs> it, yeah, if you had if you had someone around, uh, say, 310 light years away, Canopus, you had a base out there, yeah. and you say, hi, guys, back on Earth, how's it going? And 310 years later, they would hear this message. If they replied straight away, it would take another 300 years to get there. Yes. So you see, it would be 600 y years just to pass that the t yes. time of day. So it's pointless having an empire. It's like saying, well, we're being invaded, because by the time they learn about it, it would have been 
it'll be too just late. the history you take. <laughs> yeah, where were you guys? Uh, that, oh, that was 300 years ago. Yeah, yes, exactly. that's right, yeah. Yes. Something to always bear in mind. Anyway, uh, now coming down opposite from Sirius, down the Belt Star, we come to Aldebaran and the Hyades, right? And uh, the Hyades, you can d pick them out, and they've got this V-shape of stars. Now, actually, it's actually a, actually a cluster of stars. There are about 150 stars moving through star space together. They're relatively young, you know, only oh, 250 million years old. I know that might sound pretty old to you, yes. but as far as stars go, they're babies. But they're just, they're just children in, um, in stellar terms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then there's... Aldebaran. Uh, Aldebaran is not part of the cluster. It's, it's closer to us, okay? Uh, the Hyades have got a distance of 153 light years. Aldebaran is a lot closer, all right? It is what we call a red giant. Its distance is 65 light years, and it's 425 times brighter than the sun, okay? So this is a red giant. It too mm. would have been a star like Sirius once, and it's expanded into a red giant. And eventually it will either explode or get rid of its matter and all that's going to be left is a white dwarf yes, yes. Yeah. anyway having said that um i thought keith might might like to play us a quick tune <laughs> yes well i've got my flute here again one day i'll bring my uh bring one of my keyboards with me so i'm more of a keyboard player than a flute uh, <laughs> flute player but uh... yeah so this is a piece that I wrote a long time ago. Thank you, Keith. There you go. <laughs> right, so that's all Deborah you can be our night sky. And uh, if we carry on on that line from through the belt, past old Deborah and the Hyades, we come to the Pleiades star cluster in the sky. And they're actually quite easy to pick out once you know where they are, all right? But of course, we always see the, the picture I've just shown you at the moment, which is a photograph taken through a large telescope. And whenever we look at the Pleiades, which of course is Matariki, mm. uh, also known as the Seven Sisters, this is how they're shown. But of course, you can't see that with the eye at all. Yes. Um, they're, uh, they're very distinct there, and they're quite famous, which is why they have so many different names in different cultures. The, the Greeks called them the uh, Pleiades. Uh, in English, they're called the Seven Sisters because... You can usually, naked eye, see about seven of them. Um, in Japan, they're known as Subaru. And in Maori mythology, of course, they're known as Matariki, the little mm. eyes. That's right. Yes. Now, we talk about the number of stars you can see. There's actually nine that can be seen with, with a good eyesight. Depends right. how good your eyesight yeah. is. But there's only seven sisters. The yes. seven sisters, the other one, two are mum and dad. But in actual fact, the cluster contains over 400 stars, right? Yes. Right. So how, we, what we're seeing is the giant stars, the very hot, big, bright ones and so on. So that's that's the Pleiades that you can see in the sky. And look, and I identify them out, and of course, these are the stars you're looking for, the dawn rising mark in the beginning of the year. And of course, this was a, a tradition right the way across Europe and Asia thousands of years ago. Yeah. The rising of these stars actually marked the spring equinox. The return of life on Earth in the Northern Hemisphere 
following the long, harsh winter. And so that's what marked the beginning of the And that would year. be a very welcome sight too. Absolutely, yes. yeah. So that's what they were. And in turn, that is a tradition that's been brought into the Pacific by the Polynesians who, when they migrated in yeah, mm. thousands of years ago. Okay, so let's have a look at another little science post. If we then look at, go straight down from Orion towards the horizon, and near the horizon you will see a big bright star. That big bright star is Capella, all right? Um, and in fact, that's about as high as it actually gets here. But of course, where I come from back in England, it would be right overhead. Okay? Mm. That is also mm. the difference. Mm. The Capella is also another binary star. Go remember, see, our sun is a single star, but stars which have got multiple systems are actually quite common, right? Yes, yes. I've heard of you know many many binary stars. There are the two stars orbit each other, and uh, some of them there are trinary stars and even tertiary stars. Oh, we will be having a look four, at well, four stars yeah, in the system. Yeah. And all this sort of thing. Anyway, yes. Capella is 42 light years away. Um, the two bright stars are one is 79 times brighter than the sun. The other one's 78, and they orbit around each other in a period of 104 days. Now you can't see this even with a telescope because they're actually so close together, yes. right? But we, we can, with big instruments, detect the two stars and mm. the way in which they orbit around each other. Now so let's... Got that's a Capella. around Capella, you, <coughs> you would see um, two sunrises and two sunsets every that's day. That's right. And yes. the, both yes. of their colour, colour-wise, they are similar to the sun, right? Mm. They're yellow stars, they're not reds, and so on. OK, now, if we come from Rigel down through the belt stars, down to uh, through Pooh Be uh, Betelgeuse, we come to two bright stars in the sky, all right? And this is Pollux and Castor, right? Mm. This is Gemini, the two heavenly twins. So let's have a look at Pollux first. It's another red giant. See, all the big bright stars we look at, they're giants. It's 34 light years away and 32 times brighter than the sun. So that's Pollux there, okay? But Castor, on the other hand, is something entirely different. It's actually, it's a white star, but what we discover is there's in fact a system of six stars, and this is exactly what you were talking about. Exactly, monthly. yes. So Six stars all in orbit around each other. Yeah. I mean, it, imagine, imagine that. Yes. So what, what you've actually got is th three binary systems, uh, two white hot stars, uh, orbiting around each other, and then another pair of yellowy white stars orbiting around each other, and then a pair of red stars, faint red stars orbiting around each other. Mm. And in turn, each of those pairs is orbiting around the other stars. It's, it's been quite a complex orbit, I would think. But yes. obviously over, over millions of years it's quite stabilised. So you lived on the Castor system, you have six suns instead of uh, yes. one. <laughs> I, I like to uh, think of the six stars of Castor as being like couples dancing on a dance floor <laughs> and they're spinning around each other but they're also moving around the dance floor and it's just, it, roughly the same kind of uh, same kind of movement yeah, yes that's right yeah. yeah yeah so interesting we've got to remember when we look out there and we're, we're putting together what it was like what it would be like on other worlds you have to take all these things into account yes. so what we have here on earth and our solar system is magnificent and there may obviously be many many places out there which are very similar to that we've also got some places like castor which would be very very different right? yeah okay so yeah that was the orion signpost and then going upwards here they are now are you looking at them on there bringing up all of those bright stars that you can see just using it Ryan as a signpost. Mm. Look folks, and that's this is your way to find your way around the heavens, all right? You start off by identifying the big bright objects in the sky, the big bright stars, because they don't change over time. Well, they do over millions of years, but not in our lifetime. Yeah. And Orion is, of course, our summer sign. Once you've found Orion, you can then use the Orion signpost to identify other bright stars in the sky. And then once you've done that, you'll be amazed how quickly the brain remembers that. <laughs> and yeah, and then after yeah. a while, you can then begin to pick in other bright things in the sky as well. Yeah. Yes.
it's amazing how quickly you once you start start getting the hang of it, how you learn the uh, the star patterns. You can pick out the uh, the various constellations and the stars and that just literally uh, literally by eye. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I often say to people, well, the only thing I can really compare it to is when I was a kid back at school learning the, a map of the world. Yes. Right? Yes. Now, as a kid, it looked really complicated, you know <laughs> what I mean? But after a while, you learnt, You started off by learning the big places first, the continents, Africa, Australia, and Americas, and things like that. And New Zealand. Yeah. New Don't Zealand. New Zealand. <laughs> yes. Never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, so you pick out the big, bright, uh, uh, big areas first, and then you, you, you divide it up and gradually begin to identify different sections. Exactly yes. the same thing with the night sky. You identify the big bright areas, and and they, that will stick in your mind just like a map of the world. And you use those as signposts, yeah. yeah, almost absolutely to find your way. So when when yeah. Keith, and Keith and I go out at night, we walk out at night, so we look at oh, there's the Rhine, oh, there's Canis Major. Oh, yes. You just your eyes just follow it around like you would on a map of the world. Yes. You find your way around, yes. and if something's different out there, a nova, a planet. Our eyes immediately pick out. Oh, yes. That shouldn't be there. Yeah, we uh, we saw a few meteor, uh, a few meteors last night. By the way, mm. there's. I'm trying to remember the name of the name of the swarm that's happening at the moment. Well, we can have a look at that next time. Yes, we can have exactly. a look at meteor showers yes, and yes, what they're all yes. about. Yeah, meteors also known as shooting stars, and they just flash across the sky. They look like stars moving very quickly, and then they suddenly disappear. Uh, but what they are, in fact, uh, I won't spoil the plot here, but um, just small pieces of matter burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. Mm. And we'll, we'll be talking about that next time. Yeah, yeah. They look spectacular, but I'll tell yes. you what, a lump of rock the size of your fist would turn the night sky into broad daylight <laughs> as it comes yes. in. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, we, 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 we should look at that, the asteroids and the various things like that. Would you like to just... <laughs> Finish off that because that's a program. Uh, another quick tune. Yeah. Um, my voice is a little bit croaky because I've been talking a lot last night over the over the last few nights, helping helping out Richard and Kay. Yeah, he, at, does, he uh, does talk a lot, doesn't he? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 